Good morning, explorers. Welcome back. We're here for another episode of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Soraya, and I'm going to be helping guide you through our exploration today. But I'm not alone here in the studio. I'm here with my teammate, Sarah, who's going to be helping control all the media that you see behind me while we explore together. So you're also a really important part of this exploration, and we invite you to be scientists with us to help us do things like make observations, talk to other scientists, so we're going to talk back and forth, and to share out what you're thinking. Your brain and perspective is different, and that's important. Us scientists come together and share those ideas, and that's how we learn more. So feel free to reach out and share your thoughts with us at these numbers below. You can text us your live questions to 562-286-1838, or you can email us questions at live at lbaop.org. We'll answer those questions on screen here and we can help you understand what you're curious about. So for now, let's get into it. Today we're going to be exploring this amazing habitat behind me. Now this is actually images from our kelp forest here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. This is our blue cavern exhibit. Now a kelp forest is a really incredible place because it's part of our ocean backyard here in Southern California, which means if you go out into the water here, you're probably going to find some seaweed and maybe even some kelp. You've probably even been to the beach where you saw maybe those kind of slimy, stinky piles with maybe you've seen some of these large leaves and those little bubbles that you maybe popped. Those are important parts that build the habitat that is the kelp forest. Now, just like on land, the structure that gives the animals the homes, places to live, that invites other community to come be a part. Well, the kelp is the really important part of the structure here in the kelp forest. All the way from the very bottom to the critters dwelling in the gravel and the bottom in the rocks, up all of these types here, all the way to the surface, there are animals using every single part of this kelp. From critters that live in the middle like crabs and fish hiding out in between, to some crawling on the ground like sea stars or urchins, to animals that swim in between and all around like some of our larger predators, like our seals, sea lions, and otters. So today we're gonna get to explore some of those creatures together. Again, if you have questions about any of those animals or what you're seeing, we encourage you to send us in those questions. You can find those numbers below. For now though, let's take a moment and make some observations. Whoa, something big just swam by. I'm gonna step off screen so that we can see what we're noticing in this amazing habitat here. Well, I tell you a little bit more about our kelp forest. So as we were mentioning, the big leafy structures you're seeing are the kelp. And that is what is building the home for all these animals. Now, if you look close to the bottom, it's a little tricky to see. But maybe we can try and take a look at how does the kelp hold on to the ground? Now, it's important to think about because kelp's a little different than plants on land. So plants on land have roots that dig into the ground, that spread out, that connect to other plants and send each other messages, information, sometimes even nutrients. But kelp's a little bit different. It's not boring into the ground. It's actually hanging on to something on top of it in something called one of these right here, beautiful. So this is actually called a hold fast. And you might be thinking that it kind of looks like roots and you'd be right. This is the root like structure, except its main purpose is to hold on. That's why it's called a hold fast. In marine bio, things are often named after their function or what they look like. So these are holding on, but the kelp is actually getting its nutrients from something way up top. And you can kind of see a glow of it here in this beautiful image. So this was taken out in our actual kelp forest by some divers. And in the shot here, we've got one of our beautiful sheep heads, another famous kelp forest creature. But let's get back to that kelp. We were saying that it's getting its energy from this glowing thing here. What might that be? Have you ever heard of any plants or alive things that get energy from something that's glowing? Yeah, these critters, this life form here, our kelp, is getting its energy from the sun. It gets energy from the sun, it builds those leaves, and those leaves help pull the kelp up to the surface. Once it reaches the surface, it can just flop over and keep growing along the top. And that's pretty amazing. Kelp can grow up to two feet in a day, which is a huge amount. Check out those beautiful images here. We can see the sunlight shining through. And the thing that's really amazing is that California, Southern California, is actually perfect habitat for this kelp to grow. We've got the exact right conditions that it needs. So 
So kelp needs chilly water, lots of nutrients, and the space. But it also grows pretty close to the shoreline. So sometimes that can be problematic when humans come in contact with it. So this is a beautiful image here. Let's see if we can explore some of the creatures that maybe inhabit this place. So we were talking about things that were living in here. What do you think might live in a kelp forest? Ah, this is one of our amazing creatures here. This guy is one of our, what kind of animal do you think this is? A sea lion, you're right. So how did you know that it was a sea lion and not a seal or an otter or a whale or a dolphin? You might be thinking there's some things that tell you a lot about it. And you're right. Do you notice these beautiful whiskers right over here? Yeah, those long whiskers definitely give us a clue. What about this big old body? If I look really closely, it looks like it's covered in hair. That tells us it's a mammal, just like those whiskers. This is a mammal, one of our famous marine mammals, one of our local species here too. Now, a sea lion, we know it's a sea lion and not a seal because of these little structures here. Any guesses what those might be? Ears, exactly. Sea lions have these little noodle ears on the side of their head. So if you ever see an animal that has big, beautiful eyes, hair all over its body, an excellent swimmer, whiskers, and you're not sure what it is, look for those little ears because other animals that live in the kelp forest, like our seals, might look a little bit like these animals, but they don't have that outside ear structure. Oh, perfect. Let's see if we can check out this amazing creature now. Excellent. This is one of our harbor seals here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Now, another incredible and important Southern California species. Are you noticing any similarities with our sea lion that we just saw? I'm noticing those whiskers. I'm noticing that fur on that body and the big, beautiful eyes. These marine mammals tend to have these big, gorgeous eyes. Now, I'm noticing the colors different, though. Are you noticing that, too? Yeah, this is what's called disruptive camouflage. Now, you might have heard of camouflage, right? So camouflage is what helps you blend into an environment. We've got some experts of camouflage here at the aquarium. Our octopuses. Those creatures definitely are experts at hiding in their own habitat, making themselves look like they don't even exist where they are. That helps them survive. Now, this is another form of camouflage that's also helpful that helps these amazing creatures survive. Now, this disruptive camouflage, it comes in like blotchy sort of patterns. Now, these blotchy patterns we see in different kinds of animals. Fish sometimes have this expression as well. But this kind of helps them blend in in places that might not necessarily be one color. But when you think about the life of a seal, they're on the move a lot. So they need to be able to blend into different habitats, but they don't have the same skin as an octopus that makes them able to change their skin color. So they kind of have to have some skin that works wherever they go. And this is the skin that they've adapted to. This coloration is an adaptation. Do you remember what those adaptations were? I know we've chatted about these in AOAs, but if you're just joining us for the first time, Adaptations are important things on animals' bodies that help them survive. So think for just a moment. We're all animals. Can you think of any adaptations that we have on our bodies that maybe help us do stuff? Feel free to send in those questions and comments or your answers to these numbers below. Mm -hmm. I was hearing thumbs. Yes, thumbs are an important adaptation, but why? What can we do with thumbs? Feel free to shout it out or send it in. You could hold something, like holding onto a cup to drink some water. You could play video games. Definitely need those for the controllers. What about holding a pencil to write something or to draw? Or gripping when I'm climbing? Thumbs are a really important part of our body that help us do things that help us survive. So that's one adaptation that we humans have. We have so many, but just like every other animal, they all have tons of adaptations that help them survive in their habitats. So let's get back to this seal right here. Do you see any other adaptations that might help it survive where it lives? Now we said it's on the move a lot. Right now we're noticing this animal is on land, but I wonder if this creature ever goes in the water. Thumbs up if you think it does. Certainly does. 
These creatures are almost potato shaped because it makes them really easy to swim around in the water. Something else that helps them, that's important adaptation, are these amazing appendages here. You can see a nice laid out one over here. Those flippers help them swim through the water. Now they are not necessarily always swimming like this, like a bird or like a fish always flapping, but their tails, they often move the water with those back fins and it helps them push themselves around to get around a lot easier in the water than on land. On land, they do a funny kind of moving called galumphing. It's kind of like if you were to lay on your belly and do the worm, but now imagine a really pudgy potato doing that worm action. That's called galumphing and that's what our amazing seals do. So let's see if we can check out another creature that may be hiding out in our kelp forest. And then we will get to our important ones, our feature creature for today. Let's see if we can see one more, maybe even, ooh, this giant fish right here. This amazing creature is a giant sea bass. And another creature using some camouflage to hide out where it lives. I'm going to step off so you can get a good look at this. But do you notice how those grayish areas on its body, the light and dark spots, kind of help it blend into this sort of murky backdrop here? Absolutely. That's important because this creature too definitely needs to hide out. Now these animals are amazing, but they are threatened, which means that their populations have gone down. But we have programs to help save this species and to help repopulate them. But let's learn a little bit more about them first. These amazing creatures can be up to seven feet long. That's pretty tall. That's way taller than your average human. And they can be up to 700 pounds. That's like the size of a cow. Can you imagine a seven foot long, 700 pound fish swimming next to you in the kelp forest? I might be a little bit intimidated, but you might be interested to know that this is a slow moving fish. This amazing fish is just trying to cruise through the kelp forest. They have an interesting way of hunting. They do kind of a suction sort of motion when they hunt. They'll open that big mouth that you're seeing over here. Take a big deep gulp and suck in their prey. Now these guys became interesting to fishermen because 500 pounds, 700 pounds of meat, that's a lot of meat and they're not very fast. That makes them easy to catch. So their numbers got hunted down to a dangerous amount. So there's institutions like us who are helping try to regrow those populations. We were actually the first to be able to grow a giant sea bass, to raise a giant sea bass in an aquarium, which is a pretty amazing thing. So one of the things we do here at the aquarium is we try and help some of these species. And this is an example of one of those. Our last little friend is one of our flora creatures who's covered in spikes, an important kelp forest creature that this creature might be interested in munching on, as well as some of our others. Now, this amazing creature, ooh, let me step to the side so you can see. Any guesses what, where's the animal in this picture? Is it this down here? No, that's the kelp, right? Is it this up here? Definitely. Any ideas what that animal is? You're right, an urchin. This is a purple urchin. Now, these guys are often named by what they look like. So we have red urchins here at the aquarium too. There's also some urchins called pencil urchins that have really thick spikes, which is how they get their name. They look like they're kind of a bunch of pencils. But back to this amazing creature here. Do you see any adaptations on this animal's body that might help it survive where it lives? I'll tell you that this creature is seen as delicious to other creatures that live in this habitat. So it needs a little bit of armor and structure to try and help protect it. So this amazing animal is covered in these spikes. And what's the most amazing thing to me about these spikes is that they can move each one individually like a ninja. So if you put up your ninja arms and you were like doing a ninja battle, but imagine your whole body was covered in ninja arms and you could feel all the way around your body. That's pretty amazing. The other thing that they have on their body are little tube feet. So in between all these spikes, there's these little tubes and they each have a little suction cup on the edge. That helps them grab food from above, but it also helps them walk around kind of like a sea star. You're seeing right now, this urchin is munching on this food because they have to get their food and work it all the way to the underside of their body, which is where their mouth is. We have an urchin test here that we can take a look at on our document cam. Oh, beautiful. There's those little two feet. See all those little skinny spikies? 
Well, those spikies aren't actually spikes. They're just skinny little squishy tubes. And those are how they grab things around them. Excellent picture. Let's see if we can check out that urchin test now. Now this is one right here. And you might be saying, wait a minute, how is this one of those if, let me zoom in just a little bit, get our focus, there we go. How is this that same animal we were just looking at? That's an excellent question. So this animal is not alive anymore. So when urchins pass away, they lose all their spikes, they all fall off. And then we're left with what's like the skeleton of an urchin. This is the structure left behind called an urchin test. And this, the underside, this would be where their mouth is located. And the insides where their structures, their stomachs, all that good stuff would be. Pretty amazing little creatures, huh? Important members of our kelp forest. Because they like to munch on the kelp. But they're also amazing and beautiful. Now the thing is, balance is so important in the ocean. And we learn that a lot from nature. That when the balance of one thing is thrown off, we see effects of it in other places. So these little urchins are doing their urchin thing, much living their lives, but typically one animal eats another animal and they keep that balance going. Now, the next animal we're gonna talk about is our feature creature and has an important role to play with these amazing urchins. So today our feature creature is our Southern sea otters. Oh, look at these cute little babies. Yes, so these amazing animals are some of our ambassador animals here at the aquarium, an important species that we use to talk on a lot because they're one of our important neighbors here in Southern California. So Southern sea otters are a specific kind of sea otters that only live in this place. So they live in the kelp forest, like we were exploring all those wavy kelp vines, among all these other creatures like sea lions, seals, urchins, those giant sea bass, they're all part of the same community. Now. These players have an important role to play in the community because they help us keep the balance of things. Predators eat things, smaller animals eat things. If everybody eats and a balance, it keeps. So these amazing animals are kind of even more amazing because they have one of the most varied diets out there. They eat so many different things. And even here at the aquarium, when we feed them, you can find them munching on all different kinds of different delicious little members of this habitat. Now they eat things, I think this might be some crab here. <laughs> Clams, urchins, sea stars. Can you imagine trying to eat a sea star? How would you get those sticky feet into your mouth without it getting stuck? <laughs> another sea star. Flip one over and make a sea star sandwich. Then the sticky feet are touching the sticky feet. And then oh, they can enjoy it. Now otters, because they eat a lot of things, that means they have to be really good hunters. So otters are constantly diving down to the bottom of the kelp forest to find their food, scavenging around, ooh, excellent video for us, scavenging around, looking for things that they can grab, and they bring those things up to the surface. Now this is one of our otters having a little snack here, munching on some food. And you'll notice that when otters eat they're hanging out on their backs with their bellies up. And they're using those tiny little adorable paws to help work the food into their mouths. Now they use their bellies kind of like a little table. And the reason they do that is because some of those creatures that they eat come in some hard shells. So how would you eat something that lives in a hard shell or an urchin? Well, First thing they would do is they would dive down and grab it. They'd bring it up to the surface and sometimes otters even have a rock. Oh, perfect, thank you. They'll bring it up to the surface, they'll put that little rock on their tummy and they'll take whatever they're trying to eat and they'll bash it on there. And sometimes they'll put the food on their tummy and they'll use the rock and they'll smash it on there. And they're using a tool to help them get into their food because their teeth are pretty amazing and we'll look at those next but they do sometimes need help. So this is an amazing thing that otters do that's important for us to look at because using tools is an important sign of intelligence. So we know that otters are really smart species. Let's see if we can take a look at those teeth now. Come on over, let's check it out. So there's our urchin test. Now this here, I'm gonna back it up, is an otter skull. Now this is a model 
we have these here so that we can examine how amazing their structures are. Now let's check it out. So this is the side. We see the place where their big eyes would go. The front, this is their, where their big nose would go, but that's not all their nose and their eyes. And then their teeth. Let's take a look inside at those teeth. First of all, check out these big canines right here, even on the bottom. Those are pretty sharp teeth. That means they're digging into something. But if we look even closer, and I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit. This is their top jaw here. Let me get, there we go, nice and focused. Now here we are, check out these back teeth. Look how wide these are. To me, they almost look kind of like gum, like chewing gum. They're really wide and they're kind of flat. I'll show you the side too. They're kind of flat. So when you think about your teeth in your mouth, what do you use your back teeth for? Are you chomping with your back teeth or are you grinding with your back teeth? Yeah, you're grinding. So your back teeth are not quite this big, but they do the same function, just like the otters. I'll pull this top jaw too. Let's look at this. Notice the In the front. those urchins were purple that we saw a moment ago. Oh, and here's a sea star, for example. If you're curious about some of the very many hard things that an otter can crush with these formidable teeth. I'll leave this open so you can observe for just a moment. Excellent. Now, otters are some of the fuzziest animals out there. You might have thought that when you saw their picture that they're so fuzzy and adorable and something about their fur is very, very attractive. It makes us go, oh, but it's all, I see, come on, look at this picture. Look at this baby, this is one of ours here at the aquarium. We'll talk about them in just a second, but observe the fuzz. The fuzz is very important to acknowledge because they have the densest fur in the animal kingdom. Now, density refers to how much is packed into a small area, okay? So, let's think about what that means. In the size of a quarter, think it's about quarter size. You can make a circle with your fingers. Otters have about one million hairs. That's a lot of hairs for a tiny space. But to help you understand what that means, because it's kind of like, okay, that sounds like a lot. But let's understand that. What that means is if you and 10 friends got together, and you gathered up all your hair, that would be about the same amount as would be in that much size of otter hair. That's pretty spectacular. So do you think that might be attractive for some reasons? Absolutely. And this is part of why otters have been hunted almost to extinction. Humans have been very interested in their fur. Now, thankfully, We've come a long way and we've got some regulations and restrictions that don't allow people to hunt these otters for their fur any longer.
they're considered an endangered species and a protected species at that. Because their populations have come down so much, there's only about 3,000 southern sea otters left in their natural habitat. That might sound kind of sad, and it is. For some of us, that was heartbreaking. So someone decided to do something. A lot of someone's decided to do something. So we here at the Aquarium of the Pacific have a special program called our Sea Otter Surrogacy Program. And a surrogacy program basically means we have some really amazing mama otters who are so good at being mama otters that they take care of other otters' babies who maybe lost their mamas. So we work very closely with the Monterey Bay Aquarium up north, another place where you can find these amazing little critters. I love this picture so much. Look at this little loaf of adorableness. This is one of our baby sea otters in our surrogacy program. So sometimes when otters are out in their natural environment when they're hunting, they have to go and get some food. But babies can't swim right at first. They have to learn. And they also can't go underwater because they're so fluffy. Their fur is so fluffy that when they try to go underwater, they just boop, they just pop back up. They also don't really know how to hold their breath super long yet. So the, the, what will happen is the mama otter will leave the baby up on the surface, sometimes even wrapped around some kelp, like a little tie. The mama will dive down into the kelp forest and go hunt for some food. Now, sometimes those little ties get separated or sometimes the mama otter can't remember where she's left her baby or sometimes there is a predator involved and the baby gets separated from the mama. Well, to help those stranded sea otters, the Monterey Bay Aquarium is part of a program called a surrogacy program like we are. What they do is they go bring in those otters and they send them to places like us that have really amazing mama otters that help take in other babies that may have lost their parents. That's really important because that helps the survival of the species. Our ultimate goal is to help animals get back out into their natural habitat and repopulate some of these spaces that maybe we as humans didn't do such a great job of helping nature in the past, but we can certainly make different choices for our future. That's one of the incredible programs we have here at the aquarium, and it's something that we believe in and we keep doing all the time. If you ever come down to the aquarium, you can actually visit our sea otters and you'll be able to see the mamas and at least usually one baby or two up in our sea otter exhibit. If you're curious about and want more information, feel free to check out our website and continue the learning. Also, don't forget, even if you're not watching this live with us, you can always send in those questions and comments to our text line or to our email, and one of our scientists here will get back to you. We're so happy to have you join us here, and we want to give you an opportunity to share any more questions that you have about these amazing animals. Now, because they only live in limited places, it's really important for us to try and do all that we can to try and protect those habitats. So making choices that help our environment is always a good idea. You, one thing you can always do is remember, all drains lead to the ocean. All of our pollution ends up in the ocean. So the more we can do to pick up our trash, to stop pollution and runoff, the better. Even things...